Uh, I'm going to present uh, what's new in Live Framework SDK 2.0 for Android. Uh, everybody uses uh, mobile apps everywhere in, uh, a lot every day. People use mobile apps for fun and uh, for business as well. And uh, they also use mobile apps while, while they are doing other stuff, like when, while they are eating and uh, also when they shouldn't be using their mobile apps. Uh, and uh, since mobile apps are so important, uh, we should have the right tools to do these apps as fast as we can, to deliver these apps as fast as we can. So it makes me remember in 2012 where we were building Life Sync mobile app. Uh, at this time, uh, we were building this app in the uh, mobile. Uh, Life Sync mobile app is an app that synchronizes uh, your files with document library on Life And uh, at that time, while we were building Life Sync mobile, we didn't have any tools to help us with that. So we had to do everything manually and from scratch in order to access the JSON uh, Double Services uh, API, Web Services API. So also, we had to build the request ourselves. We had to configure the HTTP client ourselves. We had to execute the, the request and handle an exception. So it used to be too much work in order to access, uh, in order to invoke uh, a remote method from Lifery. So that's why we built Lifery Mobile SDK. Lifery Mobile SDK uh, help us connecting your, our mobile application with Lifery. So it's, it's a library uh, that help us requesting content from Lifery and uh, send, send any content to Lifery and uh, uh, getting the response from Lifery. And it help us with uh, handling exceptions and uh, with authentication and other stuff. It's available for Android and iOS. So after doing uh, Lifery mobile, uh, Life mobile SDK, we uh, converted all the sync code, the sync mobile app code to use it. Uh, other products from Lifery started using that as well, like Lifery screens. And uh, the community started using it a lot. So we got a lot of, a lot of feedback and uh, we saw a lot of points to improve. And that's why we are releasing uh, Lifery Mobile SDK to the row. So what's new in this new version? Uh, the first thing is that we have an annotation-based API. So it means that we don't need to generate the API. Uh, we, don't, we don't need to connect the portal to generate the API. Uh, if any one of you have used the previous version, uh, you should remember that uh, you can re remember that you, in the past, had to connect the, to a portal, to a library portal, in order to generate the API. But it doesn't necessary anymore. So you can just Build your API just using annotations. It supports default parameters. So in case you have methods with parameters you don't need in your app, you can use uh, default parameters for them. It, uh, you can parse the response automatically. Uh, you can cancel requests. Uh, it has a better configuration API. And it, it adds uh, RxJava integration. So how this? How can we build the API with the new mobile SDK? In order to create the API, you just need to define an interface. So in this example, I want to access the group service from Lifery, and I want to get the user sites. Uh, so I just need to define this interface in the method get user sites. And uh, we have to, this method must return, return a call object. In this call, uh, in this case, it uh, must be a call of JSON array because the get user sites method returns a JSON, uh, an array of sites. And then we need to annotate the interface. In this case, I want to access the group service. That's why I'm, I'm annotating the interface with the group annotation. And I have to annotate the method indicating uh, which remote method I want to access. In this case, is get user sites groups. Uh, if you See here, the get user sites method, Java method, doesn't need to have the same name 
of the remote uh, method. I can put whatever uh, Java method name I want. So with just two, these two annotations, I can define my API. It's very simple. In order to get an instance of this uh, interface to uh, uh, call the methods I've just created, I ha just have to use the service builder dot build method. And then I pass the class uh, as a parameter, and it's going to give me an interface, uh, an instance. With this instance, I'm going to be ready to call the get user size method that I've just defined. Then uh, I'm going to have a reference to a call object, but this object, uh, this, this, when I call this get user size method, I, I'm not firing the request at this moment. Uh, I'm just getting uh, a reference to this call object. And in, in, in order to call, uh, in order to execute the request, to invoke the request, I have to call this method here, execute. So at this moment, is that I'm uh, requesting uh, they get the user sites from Lifery. In, in this case, it's being done uh, uh, synchronously. And the, the response is going to be uh, a JSON array as we defined it before. But in case you want to do it asynchronously, you can as well. You just need to call the method async. And then you provide a callback with on failure and on success methods. It's all you need to do. Uh, this is a more, a little bit, um, because the previous example, we didn't have any parameters on the get user size method. So in this case, we, uh, we want to invoke uh, the add folder method, and it has some parameters. It has four, four parameters. So what does it change if I need to create a method, if I want to call a method from Lifery that has parameters? So as we did before, we have an annotation that uh, we have to put on the method, indicating which remote method I'm going to invoke. In this case, it's add folder. And for each parameter, I need to define a notation as well. So here, I have to annotate each parameter with the remote parameter name. Uh, in this case, as we had before, the Java parameter name doesn't need to be the same as the remote parameter name. I can put whatever name I want for the uh, Java parameter name. OK, so I can create my add folder this way, my add folder method. But imagine that I, in my application, I don't want to provide a description for the, uh, for the, for the folder. I want to create a folder on document library, but the description doesn't matter for me. So I can uh, remove this parameter, because for me, it does, I don't care. Then I can define a default value for it. Because if I just remove the parameter, uh, it's not going to work. So I have to, I have to define a default value. In this case, uh, I'm saying that description is going to have a default value as an empty string. So when this, the next time I call this add folder method, uh, I will not provide a description, but the SDK will fill it for me. And it's going to be an empty string, an empty description. And what about auto parsing? It's a uh, great addition as well on the new SDK. It now supports parsing the response automatically for you. So imagine the, the first uh, method we created, uh, we were returning a JSON array. But now I want to return uh, the result already parsed for me. I have to just to create the Apojo, in this case, a site with the fields I wanted to be uh, retrieved from the JSON. I wanted these four fields. Then we have defined this before. Uh, it was returning a call of JSON array, but now it's going to return a call of list of site. Then that's all, all I need to do. Uh, when I call this method again, it's going to parse it automatically for me. I don't, know, I don't need to do anything else. And what about canceling requests? Uh, I remember when we were building uh, Life Rate Sync mobile app, on some si situations, we had to cancel requests. Uh, but we didn't have uh, a way to do that on the previous SDK. So that's why we added on this new version. And it's very simple. We just need to, uh, in this case, in this example, uh, I'm calling again get user sites. And I have a, a call object reference. And, uh, this is I'm calling asynchronously, and right after I'm calling cancel. 
passing this call object. Then uh, the request is going to be canceled. So it's, it's very simple. In the, on the new SDK, we have a better uh, request configuration. Uh, I remember that on the previous version, uh, people were uh, confused sometimes on how to configure the request. And uh, we had some issues as well on the request configuration. So we decided to change the way we configure the request. So the, what we need to do is to build a configuration. And uh, we use a builder for that. And the only, the only mandatory parameter is the server URL. Uh, you can also provide other uh, configurations as authentication. You can set headers on the, for the requests. You can change the timeout, for example. And after building the configuration, you just need to set it globally. So every request is going to respect this configuration. Every time you call any method from SDK, it's going to uh, respect this configuration. But this is global. If I, what if I want a local configuration? Uh, if, or if I want to, be, to make a request and uh, pass a specific configuration to a specific request? I can do that as well. And in this case, um, creating a new configuration based on the global one. I'm getting the global configuration, and I'm creating a new one, and I'm adding a new header here and building it again. So only this request here, I'm calling get your sites again, uh, calling execute, and passing this configuration. So this execute method accepts no parameters, or I can pass a configuration. On the previous example, I, was, I show uh, with no configuration. But now I'm passing on a specific configuration for, for this request. Then uh, it's going to be used only for this. A batch request is something that we had before, but we only changed the way we call the API. So let's see how, how it works. Imagine that I want to uh, retrieve two users from Liferay. Uh, the test and the DevCon users. Um, I just need to call batch.execute passing uh, both call objects. And in this case, since I'm doing init in batch, I'm going to fire only one request to Liferay. If I don't do in batch, I need to do two requests. But since I'm doing batch, it's only one request. And uh, in this case, I need to parse the response myself. We also added uh, RxJava integration. Uh, RxJava is a hot topic in mobile development, in, in programming in general. And uh, it changed the way you program. It's, it has a different program model. It's uh, functional based. And uh, instead of be, you be pulling, pulling data, you, the data is going to be pushed for you. I'm going to try to uh, explain this a little bit better. So imagine you have a timeline, and you have a sequence of events happening. So event one, two, and three, these, these are the data. And after all these events, I have a completed event, or I can have an error if something goes wrong. So this is an observable data stream. And I can subscribe to this observable to listing for these events. So I can subscribe to listing when a new data event arrives, and, uh, or I'm going to be notified as well if an error occurs. So how can we apply this to the mobile SDK? Uh, remember that we have created the get user sites method returning a call of list of sites. But to use observables, to use RxJava, I have to change this call here to observable. And that's all I, what I have to do. That's all what I need to do. Since this get your size method is returning in observable now, I can subscribe it. And uh, I'm going to be notified when a new uh, data event arrives or if an error occurs. Uh, a great thing about RxJava is that you, can, you don't need to know in advance in which thread you want to run. You can, for example, 
when you call, uh, when you subscribe the get user sites, you can say that you are going to subscribe on IO thread. That means that the request is going to be done on IO thread. And uh, you want to observe the events on the main thread. So when, the, when new data arrives, you're going to make the request. It's going to be on the IO thread. And when the data arrives, uh, Rx Java is going to switch to the main thread for you and going to de deliver the data on the main thread. And it's going to be ready now to you. You're going to be able to set the data on any view you want because uh, you can't uh, touch uh, the views out of the main thread. You have to be on the main thread to set any data on any view you want. Uh, Rx Java also supports lots of operators. It, these are only a few. And I'm going to explain some of them. So map operator, for example, I, can, I have the, on the first uh, line, the first observable on the, at the top, I have two, three data events, one, two, and three. When I apply map uh, x plus one, I'm adding one for each data event. So the resulting observable is going to have the data two, three, and four. Filter, I can, for example, discard any data that I don't want. So uh, in this case, I'm, I just want to accept uh, if the number is greater than one. So on the resulting observable, I don't have the one uh, value, only two and three. And I can concatenate, for example, uh, observables. So in this case, I'm, I have the first ob uh, observable. And uh, it has the one, two, and three data events. And uh, the second observable, I can concat concat them, concatenate them. And uh, I'm going to have a final observable that is going to receive all the events uh, from them. So imagine that we want to uh, do something more advanced with RxJava. We want to. Uh, have uh, something like a cache mechanism, mechanism on our application that it's going to try to first access the cache. And if the cache is empty, it's going to fire the request. But we only want to fire the request if the uh, cache is empty. So I can use the concat operator for that. And uh, I, the first parameter is an observable for the database, for example. In the, the database, uh, uh, I'm going to access the database, and then uh, I'm going to fire the request. But only with this line, it's, the problem is not solved. Because if I do only this, it's going to do both observables. It's going to try to get the data from the database, and it's going to fire the request as well. So I have to use another operator. I have to chain another operator that's first. So it's only going to do the first that emits uh, any data. So if the besides observable returns data, it's not going to fire the request. But if the besides observable uh, does not return any data, if the database is empty, I'm going to fire the request to Lifery. And uh, everything else is the same as we had before. So it's a very simple way to do a cache mechanisms. And it's JVM compatible. So uh, the SDK is JVM compatible. Or you can use in any Java application you have. It's not tied to Android. It does not have any Android dependency. So everything you saw here is you can use in any Java application you have. So that's it. Uh, thanks. Uh, do you have any questions? At this moment, we would like to take questions. I don't understand it really well. Could you give me a, a, a real uh, use case on the observable? Uh, no, not get sites, because I think get sites. Yeah. Uh, Rx Java is not something. Have you heard before about Rx Java or not? It's, it's not a real uh, easy concept. You have to uh, use it uh, some time to get used to it. But this example here. I was showing is a real-world real example where you can access uh, the database, and uh, if it's empty, it's going to try to do a request. But for example, let me do, let me go here. 
So imagine that uh, you are using the SDK, and uh, the SDK is returning for, for you a JSON object. Imagine that you are not parsing it automatically. Uh, so you can use, for example, you can make the request using an observable, and uh, you can subscribe it. And uh, at the moment that the data arrives, you can apply the map operator to uh, map that JSON object to a, a, a POJO, to a plain old Java object. You, you can parse uh, yourself. So these operators are the great thing about uh, Rx Java. These operators in the, the way you define the thread at the moment you subscribe. Because you can switch the thread whatever, uh, whatever time you want. So for example, uh, here, uh, I'm saying that I want to observe the results on the main thread. But I can apply as many observe on uh, operators as I want. I can, for example, do some operations in one thread, and then I, say, I can say observe on uh, IO thread, and then it's going to change to the IO thread, and then I can do a lot of other operations, and then I can say observe on main thread. I can change the, uh, the threads as many times as I want. So it's another great feature about Rx Java. So did, did I answer the question? Is it more clear? Yes. But it, Yeah, uh, it's quite complex at the beginning, but it's very powerful.